and um, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to make us live on Facebook before I get, because it takes a second to get that started. Just one second, sorry. Well, I'm prim. All right, I'm going to start letting everyone in. Okay, welcome everybody. We are just now getting started. Just letting you know that everyone's mics and um, videos are turned off for security reasons, except for the hosts. And um, we do have to put up, I'm just gonna put up a brief slide about CME credits for just a second. Then we'll get started. And y'all can read this. Um, if you are getting CME credit from this, you do. we do recommend that you change your name on your screen to uh, your LSU address. And that is all. Okay. So Dr. Dasso, if you wanna put your. Yep. So thanks everybody for joining us. I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues and concepts that we need to start thinking about in the context of surgery. Um, obviously, uh, COVID has changed kind of the paradigm for a lot of us across all sectors. And as we start to relax a lot of the uh, social distancing and some of the uh, 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 requirements that the, governor, the governors have put in place, we're, cut, we're starting to develop kind of a new normal. And I'm gonna highlight some of the issues that we're facing on the surgical side as we start opening up for elective uh, procedures or otherwise, uh, the term that we've been uh, uh, using is time sensitive. Uh, so what are the procedures that are time sensitive where we still can't delay 60, 90 days out, um, but need to get done in a relatively short period of time, you know, within the next 30 to 60 days. And so I'm going to uh, go over a lot of uh, concepts and issues, and I don't necessarily have the answer for these. We don't have much guidance right now. Uh, and we're all trying to do the best we can with whatever knowledge uh, that we have. So traditionally on the, on the orthopedic side or on the surgical side, we've been doing about 800,000 implant-based cases per month. And so you can imagine a lot of these surgeries now uh, have been discontinued and were stopped. And so there's a lot of uh, interest from industry and other folks in terms of what the backlog is going to look like. So we've probably now going on two months now, uh, we have 1.6 million uh, implant-based cases that haven't gotten done. And so are those cases going to come back? And so how quickly will they come back? And then if you think about it, a lot of us were maxed out going into uh, COVID uh, in terms of our surgery schedule. So uh, on the total joint side, for example, a lot of surgeons were completely maxed out, not only in their office hours, but in the volume that their hospital could handle. And so if you were already maxed out before COVID, and now we've got this two-month backlog of cases, how on earth do you dig yourself out of this uh, uh, hole coming out of COVID? Um, so that's one school of thought. Uh, initially, when COVID was happening, we thought there'd be this deluge of cases as soon as we kind of flipped the light switch back on. Uh, and then how would we deal with that? I think we've quickly realized that initial uh, thinking uh, may not be panning out. And so if it comes back fast and furious, some people were projecting out that it would take us three years to kind of handle this backlog, given that we were uh, running at full capacity. It's very variable uh, what the patient response is uh, in terms of coming back and re-engaging the healthcare system. And it's somewhat regional too. So I've been talking to surgeons all around the country. For example, Nashville barely had any COVID cases and, and their patients are coming back quickly uh, because they didn't really experience the same thing we experienced in New Orleans. And so our patients are coming back extremely slowly because they're scared. And we'll talk a little bit about this later on. And so I think it's, it, it's gonna be a more nuanced um, approach in terms of how we handle uh, these cases that haven't been done and where they're gonna come from and, and when they're gonna come uh, over time. So the inpatient hospitals are still gonna struggle uh, to handle uh, COVID and surgery for many, many months. So as I alluded to earlier, 
we're not just flipping a switch and all of a sudden, you know, COVID goes away and these patients all of a sudden go away. So for example, at Oshner Kenner, we still have about a dozen patients in our ICU. Now, again, it's significantly better than uh, the 24 patients that we had uh, about a month ago, six weeks ago, and we had spillover into our cath lab and we're putting makeshift uh, ICUs and, and building makeshift ICU rooms all over the place. Whereas now it's a much more manageable number, but these patients are still there. And the hospitals still have to be prepared uh, for all different potential scenarios. So if there's sudden uh, outbursts uh, or, or we become a hotspot, for example, you know, we need to have the appropriate PPEs. We need to have the appropriate staffing. We need to have all the appropriate mitigation efforts in place. And so when we start talking about elective surgeries, how much of a drain on, on those uh, uh, baseline foundational resources uh, do the elective surgeries uh, create? And so what are the issues that the inpatient facilities need to prepare for? Because again, like I said, we're not just going to flip a switch and then all of a sudden it's back to normal uh, like it was back in February. Um, the other issues that the hospitals are going to have to deal with is revenue. So there's been, uh, as you imagine, a tremendous drop in revenue over the last two months. And so it's projected out. I saw some projections uh, earlier today, you know, that is $200, $300 billion uh, in lost revenue, where the bailout that came from Washington, D.C. Uh, only addresses about $150 billion of that. And so there's still a significant shortfall. And that's helped cover part of the revenue, missing revenue, but also all the COVID expenses. So those COVID expenses are going to continue. The revenue drop is going to continue. So a lot of the projections that we're seeing in terms of hospitals being able to survive are based on some assumptions and modeling that we still don't have our hands on because our patients aren't necessarily coming back as, as uh, quickly as we thought. Add and layer on top of that, that we have a significant change in payer mix. So with the unemployment rate as it is, uh, patients that have high deductibles and have pay cuts and have uh, taken vacation time now to survive, you know, are we going to see a change in, in payer mix where the young commercial patients that were driving a lot of the margin that we saw pre-COVID aren't, aren't necessarily going to be there post-COVID. And so what does that look like? We're seeing employed surgeons taking pay cuts and losing vacation time, private practice surgeons taking no pay um, all across the country. And so what do these financial pressures put on the health system to try to survive, let alone thrive? Um, I think, and, and a lot of the surgeons think that this is going to be a slow, cautious ramp up. Uh, it's not going to be a sudden onset of cases where we're operating, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where we're just going to see this gradual increase. And the question is, is, you know, will the slope of that curve uh, of that uh, line continue or will it plateau uh, until we get a vaccine and people are truly, truly, really comfortable uh, reengaging uh, with the healthcare system? I think we're also going to redefine what essential personnel look like uh, for the operating room. So up until now, we had people coming in and out of the hospital and in and out of the operating room, not willy nilly, but you know, we had uh, some uh, uh, guardrails around who can come in, in and out of the hospital and in and out of our operating rooms. But now, you know, we may have to scale that and become much more restrictive because of the fear of transmission and all the risks that come along with exposure. So there haven't been any necessarily big changes in terms of trainees right now, but we know that the medical students are struggling uh, in terms of getting the clinical exposure that they need right now since we've obviously uh, scaled back our clinical efforts. And so are we gonna allow or are we gonna have uh, the number of medical students uh, scrubbing in on a surgery case, for example, like we've had in the past? Um, will we potentially limit that? Uh, or will we still uh, allow all our learners to come uh, at the rates that we've been accustomed to. I don't think there's going to be any changes in terms of how resident education uh, uh, is done uh, in terms of, you know, covering cases and things like that. But, you know, we've got kind of a hurricane uh, type mentality right now where we have different teams because you don't want to risk an entire orthopedics department, for example, uh, being exposed because all our trainees and all our faculty are in one room uh, all at the same time. And so do we have to reconfigure and look at how we manage uh, our residents and our faculty uh, from a clinical perspective, which then impacts uh, training and education. Uh, potentially device and implant reps uh, that come and cover a lot of these operative cases that involve implants, uh, especially uh, on the orthopedic side, uh, they're very uh, involved in these cases. You know, do we have to look and, at, and, and reconfigure and understand 
you know, what surgeries do we truly need that expertise and that technical support for? And what surgeries uh, do we not? So is it a need to have or is it a nice to have? And what, what are the opportunities to kind of reinvent that model uh, and, and, and bring it forward into the, the 21st century? Um, a lot of health systems, especially academic uh, health systems, have observers and visitors, maybe from other countries, other surgeons, uh, locally, domestically, uh, or internationally. Um, so what are we going to do in terms of global education? And are we going to allow for that? Or will we start looking at novel and innovative technologies where potentially we have uh, telemedicine and uh, virtual reality uh, type technologies in the operating room where a surgeon uh, at a remote uh, uh, institution or, or office can put a pair of goggles on. And we've got our ORs now uh, with 3D, uh, 360 cameras. And so our visitors and trainees can now observe surgery virtually uh, in real time and still participate and, and have my microphones and all that stuff, but not necessarily uh, standing uh, in the back of the room looking over my shoulder uh, watching a surgery. So again, I think uh, the way we look at allowing people into the operating room may change, uh, at least temporarily, and who knows, uh, maybe permanently as we move on. Now, if we look at who's allowed in the operating room in terms of research and clinical trials, so if we've got ongoing research studies where a research coordinator uh, needs to be in the operating room to randomize or we're using different devices or uh, different uh, techniques, you know, what does that look like and what's our risk tolerance for that? Uh, or will we allow uh, those uh, research studies to continue? Uh, will the personnel be in the operating room that we need to help us perform these research studies? Because these research studies are extremely important in moving healthcare forward in terms of driving innovation and uh, finding uh, new opportunities uh, to improve healthcare. So I think probably a lot of the viewership may not realize that the operating room isn't necessarily just me and a nurse uh, or a scrub tech doing the surgery. There's a lot of other people, uh, a lot of other workflows and processes that are involved in these cases. And so what does that look like in terms of who can be in the operating room? When can they be there? Why are they there? Uh, so on and so forth. Again, a lot of issues, a lot of unanswered questions that I think collectively we're all going to have to work on and decide what our risk tolerance is for the different jobs and different uh, workflows and processes that need to happen. Um, because I think we'll all agree, you know, we can't bring everything to a complete standstill. We still need to be doing clinical trials and research uh, to move healthcare forward, for example. Um, there's a lot of interest in ambulatory surgery centers because they obviously were not exposed uh, to the COVID patients or not necessarily involved uh, from a frontline perspective. So in order to handle the surgical uh, backflow or backlog uh, and the surgical needs, will surgery centers potentially be the relief valve where we can unload these cases uh, to surgery centers that we think are appropriate, where traditionally, you know, we would do them in an inpatient hospital, um, but because the workflow, the throughput, the efficiency, just simply doesn't make sense right now, you know, are surgery centers potentially the opportunity uh, to help us uh, with that? Um, with surgery centers comes a significant change in how we manage these surgeries. So uh, at an inpatient facility, we've got a lot of sterilization equipment. We've got a lot of storage uh, capacity. We've got a lot of uh, bells and whistles. Uh, those don't necessarily uh, exist at surgery centers. The footprint is much smaller. Uh, the staffing uh, is less redundant, uh, and so we don't have uh, uh, the same level of resources. Uh, but nonetheless, can we potentially move some of the, I don't want to say easier surgeries, but some of the less involved surgeries out of the hospital uh, so that way we can get the patients the timely care that we, we need because we've got a bottleneck now in a lot of the traditional uh, inpatient, uh, inpatient facilities. So with that uh, uh, onion, as we peel back the layers of this onion, well, we then have to start understanding or what are the logistical issues as we move patients potentially out of the inpatient setting uh, to the ambulatory uh, surgery setting uh, for uh, medical devices and implants. And so, for example, let's say uh, on the total joint side, we were doing, you know, at a given hospital, let's say 10 uh, total joint surgeries on a Monday uh, within a hospital. Now, all of a sudden, all those 10 uh, uh, total joint surgeries get diluted across five different surgery centers on a Monday you can imagine the logistical hurdles are enormous where, you know, when it was all consolidated, all the implants and instruments and everything that, that came in from a different city are in one place. And all of a sudden we have to replicate that times five. 
as those cases get diluted out uh, to different facilities. Um, there's going to be a tremendous uh, uh, pressure on cost containment. Uh, some of these, a lot of these surgery centers are physician owned, uh, and they've had uh, the physician uh, has had significant uh, revenue disruption both on the clinical side and the surgery center on the facility side. And so, not only on the surgery center perspective, but on the hospital perspective, there's going to be a tremendous uh, pressure to contain costs in a way that we didn't even see prior to COVID. There are a lot of pressures prior to COVID because we were seeing reduced reimbursements uh, and trying to uh, move into this value-based uh, world away from this fee-for-service world. And so I suspect, you know, coming out of COVID, uh, the supply chain folks and the materials management folks are going to be even under uh, increasing pressure uh, to contain costs because revenue is not where, uh, where it was pre-COVID and it's not going to get there for quite some time. And so if you're trying to stay alive from a business perspective, either you have to reduce costs or make money, take your pick. And so if the making money part of the equation isn't happening fast enough, then it's got to be compensated somewhere else. And so I suspect there's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure uh, to contain costs uh, in terms of all the aspects of surgery that we uh, uh, typically look at. Um, from virus uh, transmission perspective, a lot of uh, restrictions now in place. And so a lot of these things started uh, during the outbreak, uh, restrictions on families and friends and visitors. Uh, during the outbreak or at the peak of this, really almost no one was allowed into the hospital unless you were a minor uh, and had a parent you know, we all heard stories left and right of patients uh, passing away in the hospital alone and uh, really in interacting with their family on, uh, uh, on their uh, uh, smartphones and, and using uh, video technology. Uh, and so those restrictions aren't necessarily as drastic as they were at the height of uh, uh, the outbreak. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we're still going to limit uh, who can come uh, inside uh, the facility. So whether it's only one visitor and that's it, or you're, that visitor uh, is not allowed at all and they have to uh, be in the car uh, and just wait for communication from us varies uh, by facility. Um, one of the issues that a lot of physicians are struggling with is what patients we should be operating on. And so some of the, some of the variables that we have to take into account are for example, sick patients or older patients or more complex patients that may have to spend the night. So should we target really the patients uh, that qualify for same day surgery first, and then look at the more complex patients that may need to stay overnight uh, a little later uh, down the road. But then that brings into, uh, you know, into a lot of or, uh, ethical and, and moral uh, challenges for us where you know, I have to tell a dialysis patient that probably would stay overnight to get dialyzed that no, you're too high risk because you're going to stay overnight. There's a higher chance of uh, virus transmission if you're in the hospital because we've got COVID patients there. Uh, you're sicker, so there's a higher chance if you do get the virus uh, that you'll have a, a negative effect from it. And, you know, we're, we're using resources, hospital resources, at a time when they're extremely precious on a patient that potentially we could have delayed uh, that care. But then you have flip it and look at it from the patient's perspective where they're in extreme amount of discomfort. Um, maybe, you know, in my uh, scenario, they were using a, a cane, for example, to walk around uh, prior to COVID. Uh, during COVID and as the disease progresses now, uh, they're in a wheelchair, right? But they're older, sicker. And so we're seeing a de decompensation of the patient. Their functional status is decreasing, yet they're higher risk of uh, challenging the health system and, and our resources. So what do we do with that? Um, you know, ICU availability. Right? So if we've got a patient with a complex uh, high-risk uh, pathology um, that needs to be addressed, but it's semi-elective, you know, should we do that or should we not? And some of the patients that we thought were elective 30 days ago are now slowly transitioning into semi-elective or semi-urgent type cases. And so where do we draw the line? Uh, what are we willing to tolerate? What can the system handle in terms of resource allocation? Uh, and and who, how do I, as a physician, pick winners and losers in terms of who's allowed to have surgery and who's not. Um, and it's a difficult position to be in uh, because I have to balance uh, the system with the needs of that individual patient. And it, it, it's really challenging to tell a patient that I understand you're in pain, you have a knee replacement, for example, that is loose uh, and you can't walk, but redoing that knee replacement is not necessarily a time sensitive surgery that we can do now can we put it off 60 days, 90 days, 
what have you. Uh, and the patient sits there and then asks me, so I have to suffer now uh, until you're ready for me. And these are very challenging discussions uh, to have. And, and again, I don't have the right answer and we're doing the best we can. And there's really no real good guidance for us right now. Uh, and it's really being left up to me uh, really to decide if this is a time sensitive uh, surgery that needs to go. And uh, you know, I have to negotiate all these variables. Um, some of the other uh, challenges that we're facing is uh, virus transmission from the healthcare worker to the patient or the patient to the healthcare worker, right? So I have to, we collectively have to worry, you know, are the, is the testing that we're doing adequate enough? And so there's some data out that the PCR testing, the RNA testing that we're doing, you know, in some instances only has a 70% uh, sensitivity rate, 80%. So there's a fair number of patients that are testing negative who are in fact positive. And so when we're intubating in the operating room, uh, you know, uh, giving the patients general surgery, and we have someone who we think is negative, but in fact positive, you know, are we exposing our healthcare workers to uh, additional risk? And so- Dr. you're, um, can you adjust your mic? You got a little lower, your volume. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys, can yeah, you guys hear me now? That's good, yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Um, and so, you know, so, how, how sensitive and how good are our testing uh, that we're doing right now? And how often do we test everybody? So on the healthcare worker side, since we're in the operating room continuously, you know, do we test our surgeons, our nurses, our x-ray techs, everybody in the operating room on, an, on a routine basis? Is it weekly? Is it, is it every other day? Is it daily? You know, so where do we draw the line? Um, so that way we can have a handle on you know, who potentially is uh, at risk and uh, uh, giving additional risk for uh, transmission. Um, Postoperatively, uh, there's a lot of worry around uh, COVID-19 and potentially hypercoagulable states. So if the patient, for example, comes in and they're negative and then they leave the hospital and potentially uh, got uh, virus transmission from someone in the operating room or someone at the hospital, uh, and then they go home and turn positive, we now have potentially put the patient at increased risk for complications and issues that we still don't appreciate. So we know in the ICU uh, on the medical side, a lot of these patients were going home with blood thinners. And what, what the medical physicians or doctors were finding is a lot of these patients were in a hypercoagulable state. They're finding DVTs, pulmonary emboli, so on and so forth. Uh, after they were being discharged from the hospital. So they were on these very powerful blood thinner medicines. So if I've got a patient now that turns positive uh, after, for example, let's say a total joint replacement surgery, which is already high risk uh, for DVTs and PEs, uh, and then we layer on top uh, uh, positive COVID uh, potentially, in the midst of creating a cytokine storm that's iatrogenically created, I created the cytokine storm, the inflammatory uh, state, that the patient's in after they leave the hospital. And then we layer COVID on top of that. And then layer on top of that, that uh, they're potentially in a hypercoagulable state. If they do get COVID, you know, are we, are we creating harm? Are we unnecessarily creating harm? Uh, or how do we mitigate that? Assuming all the stakeholders agree that that's a risk uh, we're willing to take and that the benefits outweigh those risks. So again, I'm just highlighting uh, uh, clinical issues, scientific issues that we need to think about. Hopefully it's not going to be an issue and we're just going to start doing this and, you know, uh, uh, these patients uh, are doing well and, and we don't have anything to worry about other than maybe a little bit of increased risk, but the baseline risk is no different than prior to COVID. But I think we have to be cognizant and aware of additional risks uh, because I think this the COVID is, is proven to be really complex and we're finding new things uh, as we go. Um, the next issue is when we test patients preoperatively. I'll tell you here locally, we've got uh, guidance uh, at the hospital level and at the facility level that's all over the place. So we've got some facilities that aren't testing patients at all unless they're symptomatic prior to surgery. And we've got other facilities that are testing patients, all patients mandatory testing within 72 hours of surgery, no matter what. So it's all over the place. And so how specific, like I said, how specific and how sensitive is the testing uh, that that facility is using because it varies. Uh, and that sensitivity is based on uh, technique. We know that uh, the swabbing of the nose is really inconsistent. And so a lot of the uh, poor sensitivity of these testing is because, you know, the patient doesn't want the swab or they pull away and they think they got uh, the, the swab deep uh, uh, in, the, in the nose as, as, as possible, but they didn't. 
Um, and so we just don't have a handle on what the appropriate uh, workflow is. Or do we simply just treat every patient as if they are positive, right? So if we do treat every patient as if they are positive in the operating room, then the logistics in the operating room changes dramatically. Um, so there's a group of uh, physicians uh, out of the Pacific Northwest called ProLiance. It's a humongous uh, surgery group out of there. They created a document on how they plan to move forward uh, with uh, surgical patients at all their uh, surgery centers and all their facilities. And if you've got a positive COVID patient, there's an additional half an hour to 45 minutes uh, added to the case where prior to intubation, everyone has to leave the room. And anesthesiologist then intubates in the same room or a different room. Then you've got to wait 15 minutes. Then everybody comes in. You do the surgery. Then extubation is another 15 to 20 minute wait, right? So if you use that workflow, uh, assuming or, or, or under the every patient is positive uh, mentality, we're going to have significant efficiency and throughput issues, right? And then layer on top of that, let's say I find out, you know, let's say a, a facility has only a 48 hour testing and I do surgery on Mondays and I find out Monday morning that they're positive. All of a sudden your whole surgery day is gone, right? Because we are then going to cancel that case. And so we just lost a, an invaluable resource because we had no idea that the patient was positive until the morning of surgery. So a lot of uh, complexity here. Uh, that we have to start thinking about as we open up the operating rooms. And the operating rooms are really opening up literally as we speak. You know, this week, a certain number of hospitals are doing elective cases that weren't the week before. Next week, we have new ORs opening up that weren't doing any surgeries until now. So these are uh, issues and concepts that are starting to come up that we have to start thinking about um, because it's really inconsistent and we don't have really a nice uh, kind of global uh, workflow that, we, we're, that we're all uh, doing. Uh, some other things to think about is OR competency. We know from research that volume is linked to quality. So the higher volume surgeons and the higher volume institutions or the more uh, uh, specialty specific surgeons or the highly specialized surgeons seem to have better outcomes uh, than kind of the jack, jack of all trades, if you will. And so if we don't have volume, then we lose that level of competency and expertise that we saw prior to COVID. So if you're only doing one or two cases a week, whereas before you were doing 10 a week, you know, what does that mean to the OR staff, to the nurses, to the hospital? You lose that, that kind of uh, repetition where that's why we were achieving the quality outcomes that we were achieving. And so if it takes us a long time to get back to those volumes, we potentially can regress uh, in terms of those uh, competencies uh, that we had surgeon, uh, scrub tech, nurses, institutional uh, uh, workflows and processes, uh, so on and so forth. And so layer on top of that, you know, with the furloughs and the layoffs, you know, are we going to have those uh, highly valued uh, staff and, and, and assets uh, coming back to the hospital or do they go away um, because they find a better opportunity or there's uh, not enough uh, 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 safety or uh, reliability in that job? The other challenge we're going to have is there's a tremendous amount of pressure, like I said, to generate revenue, right? And so there are surgeons that want to operate 24 seven. There are facilities that want to operate 24 seven because they need to recapture that revenue uh, and, and survive financially. But there's a lot of people that come along with that, right? Can, can our anesthesiologists who uh, are burning the candle at both ends that were working the hospital nonstop during COVID now transition to working nonstop uh, in, a, in, a, in a hospital that wants to go 24 seven, our CRNAs, our anesthesiologists, our anesthesia techs, right? What about our, our scrub techs? You know, uh, they maybe weren't necessarily busy uh, during, the, during the, the peak of this, but you know, can they go 24 uh, seven after surgery? Uh, Saturdays and Sundays, they have children and families and, and, and we're having staffing issues uh, in many ORs prior to this. You know, what does that look like? Um, you know, is so we have to look at burnout. Are nurses, our recovery room nurses, our hospital nurses able to handle this? Our admissions, uh, pre-op admissions and testing, you know, so it, it's nice for everyone to want to come back and, and come back full speed and full throttle, but there's a lot of uh, ancillary and uh, corollary services uh, that go along with this. And are they ready, able and capable of handling that? So we have to be sensitive to the entire team 
uh, not just the surgeon and uh, uh, the folks worried about the, uh, the P&L uh, on the hospital or facility side. So the system issues uh, are gonna be compounded and they're gonna be uh, uh, something we have to pay attention to. So again, uh, like I talk, like I mentioned, uh, if you do Monday or Tuesday surgeries and a hospital is mandating uh, testing within 24 hours, how does that work if testing facilities aren't open during the weekend, right? And so we're gonna have to do morning of testing do they have the resources and ability to do uh, rapid testing, the 15 minute testing? You know, because uh, those uh, media uh, and reagents are in short supply. And so where do we allocate all these resources to? Um, and then if we find the morning of and they're positive, all of a sudden those cases are gone and that OR goes empty. And how do you backfill those cases with a half an hour notice, right? Medical clearance for surgeries. So are the primary care physicians going to be able to clear these patients or anesthesia and pre-op testing, right? So are they in line? So if I need a cardiac clearance, are the cardiologists have uh, the bandwidth to see the operative patients, let alone the backlog of chest pain patients that failed to come to the emergency room for the last two weeks. So everybody's plate is going to be relatively full because we can't even fit those patients in our waiting room since we only have every other chair, right? And so now they're sitting in the parking lot and then we got to call them. And then, you know, if you got an elderly patient, how long is it going to take for them to go from the parking lot, seven floors up to my office, so on and so forth. So again, prior to COVID, we had these really highly tuned uh, machines. Uh, we were highly efficient of getting patients uh, through the system, uh, both in the office, uh, in the operating room, so on and so forth. And that machinery has uh, completely uh, uh, been dismantled, if you will. And so, you know, how does that work? And, and, and then how do we incorporate telemedicine uh, into this to maybe help with, with, with some of that? Um, after surgery, do we have the post-acute th uh, services available, right? So if in the world of orthopedics, physical therapy is extremely important after surgery. So do the therapists have the ability uh, to see these patients post-operatively? Do we have the home health facilities ready to go uh, to see these patients post-operatively? Can supply chain meet the needs of, uh, uh, of the ORs? So we've got PPE issues, obviously uh, pharmacy, and uh, do we have drug shortages and, and so on and so forth because we're competing with the ICUs uh, for a lot of these same medications because they're managing all these patients on vents that are uh, sedated, right? So antibiotics, so on and so forth. So again, we have to be sensitive to everyone uh, in the healthcare ecosystem to ensure that we're giving uh, our surgical patients uh, the safest and highest quality care uh, that we can. Um, there's going to be competition uh, for the OR uh, based on OR availability, right? So the world doesn't, unfortunately, doesn't revolve around orthopedics. We're all competing for very finite resources, urology, ENT, ophthalmology, plastics, general surgery, on and on and on and on. And so, you know, where do all these uh, surgeries fit in terms of the triaging and pecking order of what cases can we get done since we've got really limited uh, OR availability at this time uh, and then marrying that with all the other uh, issues. So, you know, does a, a, an ENT surgery that uh, requires uh, uh, surgery now any different or any more acute than an orthopedic surgery or neurosurgery or, or what have you? So who gets to pick? And so we've got to work collaboratively with our colleagues to figure out, you know, what the best outcome is. Um, because again, everyone needs and is interested in driving revenue on tops of taking care of these patients. And so we've all got these dynamics uh, that are influencing our decision making. And so how do we negotiate all that? Um, we have to be sensitive if we use medical devices and implants uh, to their capabilities. And so what are the logistics and, and what are the issues that the implant companies have in order to deliver uh, and help us manage uh, the volume and the cases we need? Do they have rep coverage? or they spread thin, or if there's a rep that gets sick, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean we don't do any more implant surgeries because the medical device rep's not available? And so, you know, uh, we're finding a lot of these uh, 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 lack of uh, areas of that demonstrate lack of resiliency, where we've got kind of these bottlenecks uh, that uh, bring, that make the system overly fragile. And so I think these are opportunities where we can look to see, you know, how do we create a more resilient model uh, moving forward. Um, there's also a difference between a private practice surgeon and employed surgeons, right? And so if we look at the private practice surgeon, uh, they've furloughed or laid off a lot of their staff. 
Some of their staff may have been important in terms of the uh, communication workflow, uh, communicating surgeries from the private office to the hospital, medical device company, uh, pharmacy, therapists, so on and so forth. You know, so are those communication streams uh, potentially compromised? The surgeons have a lot, a lot of surgeons that had to make the decision, uh, do I furlough or lay off my staff uh, or do I not take a salary? And a lot of surgeons have very, made very difficult decisions uh, based on you know, what they value. Um, so the financial pressure to operate and feed their kind of clinical family is real. Uh, otherwise, if we don't have a viable uh, uh, private practice, then how do they take care of the community and of the patients uh, when their business, when they go out of business? Who's going to cover the ER? Who's going to take call? Where are these patients going to follow up? Right? So that's one perspective. Uh, a, a lot of surgeons now are employed by health systems. It's somewhat safer. Uh, because uh, they have potentially the resiliency and the redundancies and the infrastructure. Uh, but they're uh, facing a lot of challenges now where employed uh, physicians are now being asked to take pay cuts or lose vacation time. And, you know, what are the downstream effects of that and potentially physician layoffs and things like that? I mean, who would have ever thought physicians being probably the most recession proof uh, profession is exposed? Right? So that tells you if physicians are exposed, then what does that say for the broader economy and other sectors and other industries? If we're not safe, then that doesn't bode well uh, for a lot of others. Um, surgeon education and clinical care. Uh, we're probably going to relook at national meetings, regional reading, meetings, uh, cadaver labs and training labs. Are we going to have large groups of physicians together uh, doing these educational uh, experiences or will that be different? Uh, can we afford to have, for example, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons uh, had to cancel their uh, national annual meeting just before COVID in, in March. And can you imagine if we had uh, 10,000 orthopedic surgeons in one singular place and all these surgeons all, uh, uh, had, had uh, the virus all at once? You know, that would have brought the healthcare system to its knees. And so can we afford to do that? now that we've seen what, what can happen. So again, what are the reasons, uh, but yet that was such an important educational uh, opportunity for us. And so how do we relook at all of this uh, to ensure redundancy, resiliency in the system, uh, but yet you know, accomplish uh, what we need, whether it's education or what have you. Uh, will we be meeting with sales reps and, and, and other folks one-on-one -on -one like we've had in the past? Or will that look differently? Will they come to my office to show me what's the latest and greatest? Or will they have to try to figure out how to get to me uh, virtually uh, or contactlessly, if you uh, will? Um, so again, a lot of different issues and dynamics that are starting to come up that are challenging uh, the paradigm and uh, what we were used to uh, prior to COVID. Uh, medical legal concerns. I was talking with some surgeons, uh, those Perline surgeons out of Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, if they do a surgery and it's not deemed time sensitive by whoever, they can actually go to jail and it's considered a misdemeanor based on the governor's uh, 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 executive order, right? So what surgeon and what hospital or what facility wants to take that chance, right? And so they're going to be extra cautious uh, and not operate on anybody uh, unless, I mean, literally you've got, uh, you know, maybe a Karakwani syndrome or compartment syndrome or some trauma. Uh, because they don't even want to even approach the line of that, you know, so you, so you're putting a burden on the patients, on the surgeons. Uh, so there are significant consequences, uh, with some of these executive orders that the surgeons, uh, don't want to risk. Um, you know, are there medical legal, uh, concerns when, uh, if a patient was negative going into the surgery and they're positive coming out? So do we have to consent the patient independently or separately? Is that part of our normal consenting process? Um, am I at risk or is the hospital at risk? Because someone can say you didn't take the proper precautions. And so now this patient is positive and, you know, God forbid gets the virus. And then uh, we have this hypercoagulable state and so on and so forth uh, because they received the virus during their hospital stay. How are you going to figure that out? Whether they got it uh, uh, at home or, or, you know, while they're in the hospital, or that means we got to be testing every day. So again, there's a lot of issues here uh, that we have to unpack that we still don't have very good guidance uh, around uh, locally, regionally, nationally uh, that need to be ironed out. Uh, and so some of us are, you know, kind of going out on a limb a little bit 
Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, at the end of the day, I kind of, the ethos uh, that uh, I have and th that's been uh, ingrained in us through all our education and training is, you know, the patient comes first. And so ethically and morally, you know, I have to take care of my patients. They are the center of the universe, if you, if you will. And so how do I do that uh, to the best of my abilities and still uh, maintain a resilient, a redundant system uh, and, and look at this holistically as well as at, at that individual uh, patient level? Um, here's some data that recently came out on, you know, how long uh, the virus lives on, on different surfaces. And so on plastics, uh, for example, it can live up to 48 to 72 hours. So as we have implants and instruments and all kinds of things uh, being shipped between facilities, uh, cardboard boxes or what have you coming in and out of hospitals, you know, what does that look like? And so does that change uh, how we manage the log logistics and workflows and, and various processes that we've taken for granted uh, up until now? You know, how will hospitals and facilities uh, manage this? Uh, again, if, if you know medical legally that the virus can, can live on something for up to 72 hours and you don't properly wipe things down or decontaminate things, so on and so forth, you know, are, who's at risk? Are we not at risk? Is it, that's just uh, the way it goes? Uh, and as a society, we just simply have to accept this or not? Um, I don't know. Uh, so again, a lot, of, a lot of things to think about um, as we move forward. So with that, I will pause and uh, hand it back over and uh, we can answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Dasa. That was really interesting. And, um, you know, I've heard a lot of reports coming out for people who have cancer and other types of um, challenges like that, that their health care is suffering um, due to coronavirus. So this was a, a timely um, webinar for sure. Um, and Sam, I think we have some posted questions. If you yeah. want to those. Yeah, um, we have quite a few. I'll start at the top. Um, so we have someone who's saying a friend of mine was scheduled for back surgery in March and was understandably this was postponed um, and the friend is now on pain medication how long in your opinion how long is she going to have to wait and is this decision going to be made by her physician or by another group so generally speaking uh, we've broken our surgeries into tiers so tier one tier two and tier three Tier one surgeries being uh, trauma cases, as you would expect, uh, fractures, uh, things like that. Again, I'm, I'm, look, I'm gonna, speaking at this from the lens of an orthopedic surgeon, but uh, similar appendectomy, you know, gallbladder, uh, things like that. Uh, tier two are cases that need to be done in the next 30 uh, to 60 days. And so these are cases where, you know, there's now gonna be progressive harm if the surgery doesn't get done. And then tier three cases are cases uh, kind of right after that, where we've got maybe 60 or 90 day window where we start to have harm. And so if you think about it, COVID has been going on for now two months. So we've got these uh, kind of tier three cases maybe that are now transitioning to tier two cases, right? Where, you know, uh, for example, with the spine uh, uh, surgery indication, you know, if the patient now is decompensating, we can define decompensating in any which way, you know, maybe it's more pain medication. So now do we want, uh, a group of patients on opiates uh, after this that weren't on opiates going into COVID. And now we've got that issue to deal with on the back end of this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we just, we're, we're managing an opiate crisis going into COVID. Now are we adding fuel to fire? I mean, uh, 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 fuel to this fire uh, where a lot of these musculoskeletal patients are on narcotics because we can't do surgery. Uh, logic deficit, for example, where they're getting more, uh, more and more weaker uh, muscle weakness. You know, that may be an indication. So to answer the question, it's really a conversation uh, between the surgeon and the patient to decide, you know, what is the, what is the pathology? What is the disease process? It is getting, is it getting worse? And does it fit, you know, within the context of, you know, these tiers um, that we've been using? Mm -hmm. And on that same note, someone else is asking, so how do you deal with elderly patients with deteriorating chronic conditions who are resistant to seeking health care due to the COVID fears? Yeah. Um, so how do we, so I guess there's two questions. One is, uh, do we manage them remotely because they don't even want to come into the hospital? Uh, they don't even want to set foot, you know, anywhere near a hospital. So can we deploy telemedicine and, and do the best we can uh, virtually? 
uh, maybe it's prescriptions or, or what have you. Um, but obviously in the world of orthopedics, a lot of what we do is interventional injections and, and things like that. And so, you know, are there solutions and technologies and options that we can deploy uh, novel things uh, that can buy us time, right? Where the patient is, doesn't quite feel safe, the, the system is safe enough uh, to have surgery. So can we uh, kind of employ more non-operative, non be more aggressive in non-operative treatments um, until the patient feels safe enough that they can engage in the healthcare system. And what I found anecdotally, at least in my practice, is the older patients are extremely scared. And so they are saying, you know, let me hold off as long as I can until I feel a little more confident uh, that the system is ready. Uh, and so at what point, you know, do they begin to deteriorate and not realize it? Or, you know, we have to nudge them and say, you know, the risk of this deterioration outweighs the risk of potentially uh, getting COVID somewhere along the process. You know, I don't know what that risk is. I don't know what the balance is. Again, it's an individualized conversation I think we have to have with each patient um, and understand kind of, kind of what their value uh, and, and what they can tolerate. Um, okay, somebody else asked, they said uh, in your discussion regarding, how, how do you feel regarding testing of patient, of parents or guardians for pediatric orthopedic surgery patients? Yeah, so that's part of the guidance is uh, for some hospitals in some places. And so are the people immediately surrounding you positive uh, and are they aware of that? And so there's some interest in, in, in testing caregivers in addition to the patient as well. Uh, and that's at an individual institutional level. And we're seeing that on the pediatric side, yes, where uh, they think the caregiver should be tested uh, just as much as, as the child is. But that same concept happens uh, on the older patients too, right? So if you've got an older patient, for example, having a total joint surgery, they have caregivers just like a child does. Um, and so do we, do, we, do we use that same uh, logic and, and apply it to uh, older patients too? Um, but it's interesting that, that that interest in testing caregivers is really on, uh, focusing on the PED side, not so much uh, on the geriatric side. That is interesting. Um, all right. Any theories on why copper surfaces are so much more hostile to virus survival compared to stainless steel? No. So I think um, there's some data and it's not very strong. And it's not very good. And it may have to do with the polarity of metal. Um, we know, uh, so we, we did some research here at LSU looking at biofilm formation on different substances uh, when I first came here. I, I was really interested in doing some infection-based research. And so we looked at cement, polyethylene, and cobalt of uh, uh, Staph aureus on different substrates. And what we found, it was harder for a bacteria to grow on uh, the cobalt chrome compared to polyethylene and um, cement. And we think it was because of the voltage and the low-grade polarity within the metal. And so there may be something within copper where its ability to transmit uh, a, a voltage uh, is better uh, which then allows it to become more prohibitive in terms of uh, growing things on it. I'm not going to say copper fries, you know, a virus or anything like that, but that's a general concept because you may have an electric charge uh, in the metal uh, that uh, uh, in copper uh, restricts uh, virus growth uh, more than other metals. But again, I don't think there's really robust research to say that. That's just anecdotal uh, hypothesis on my part. Right. Um, another question we had what strengths do you think the LSU health surgery has to set the bar in this new normal healthcare environment? Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, working with my colleagues like Julio Figueroa, uh, and uh, we, we've got, uh, we are probably, you know, I would say, you know, at the top with just about anybody else in this country in terms of, you know, framing up what the response should be and how to deal with COVID. You know, not that New Orleans being a hotspot is a good thing, but at the same time, we have an experience in the knowledge base now that rivals almost anyone else in the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, Seattle, New York, and New Orleans. I mean, we were the three uh, at, the, at, the, at the peak of this that probably learned the most in such a short period of time. So our faculty at LSU are probably positioned to speak about COVID in such a way that 
very few places uh, in the country, if not the world, can, right? I mean, there's no one in Nashville that's going to speak about COVID like we can, right? There's no one in Iowa or San Francisco or LA or anywhere else in the U.S. like we can, um, only a handful of other places. And so, uh, and, and couple that with the fact that, you know, our faculty is uh, innovating and researching things that, you know, I, I think we are extremely well positioned to, to be thought leaders in this space. That's great. And right along the same question, in the same vein, wearing your entrepreneurial hat, what are some opportunities you see? Um, I, I'll tell you, it is wide open. Um, I think if people can uh, let go of their pre-COVID uh, perception of healthcare, if you could just for a moment think about what the perfect healthcare system could look like moving forward, right? So pretend I could just magically just wipe away healthcare and you could build healthcare exactly the way you think it should be built. This is that opportunity because I challenge everybody listening in, when else are you ever gonna have this dynamic in across the globe, right? Where everyone is receptive to any, any ideas on the table right now, right? And so you can see telemedicine just exploded. Why? Because the reimbursement now caught up to what we needed for it to catch up to, right? So if we can demonstrate with whatever innovation you're thinking about that this is going to move the needle in this new, there are a lot of people that are willing uh, to listen to you. And so my general philosophy is if you have an idea that can make the system more resilient, I think there are going to be people that are resilient are, that are going to be receptive to you. Because think about it. We have a single strand of RNA that just shut down the entire world, right? To me, that's just mind boggling if I think about that. And so where are the failures in the system and what solutions do you have to create a more resilient system? Because we can't afford to do this again. So if you can clearly articulate and draw that line that your solution, your innovation is going to create a more resilient system that we don't shut down the globe or the entire economy again, I think people will listen. So it can't be kind of a me too, oh, this is cool, uh, wish I could have it type uh, invention or innovation or improvement. It's gotta be something substantive that truly moves the needle. And I think this is a golden opportunity for those people that are out there uh, to come up with those ideas. That's great. We can all look forward to see what comes out of this then. Um, I think that is all the questions we have. We, uh, I do have a couple things to wrap up. Um, this, this meeting was recorded and you can find it at lsuhealthfoundation.org forward slash coronavirus. I posted that into the chat. And then we are continuing this series of webinars for the next couple of weeks. So the next one will be on Wednesday and that will be with Dr. Springgate, and that is on um, health services delivery. So kind of similar policy pr practice and medical education. So that will be Wednesday, May 13th. And like I said, you can find the recording of this one and all the upcoming ones at that website. Thank you again, Dr. Dasa. It was wonderful to have you part of this series. We're very grateful for your time and your expertise. And until our next uh, webinar, everyone take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>